development, but now you've got it going, so <coughs> that'll be good. And we ought to talk a little bit about the state of the world, possibly. <laughs> well. There's some reason to think that all's not well with our current administration at the helm, but welcome. Welcome very much to Conversation, where it's a pleasure to welcome the program. A guest who's been a guest in the past, and that's, uh, that's Norman Weinstein. He's a playwright, and he's had a distinguished career in that field, and also a social observer and a uh, political observer. And he's also got a play recently that's just had at the stage of reading and so forth about Mr. Bullard. We're going to be talking about that and other matters. And Norman Weinstein, welcome once again to Conversation. Great pleasure to welcome you to Manhattan Network. Thank you very much. My pleasure. We talk, Could you share maybe a little of your past and then or your own background, you know, born and raised education? And then we want to get in talking about uh, what the play certainly lets me know we have a couple of photographs and some music and things. But could you share your own background, please? Well, I'm a septuagenarian, which means <coughs> I'm pretty ancient. Born and raised in <coughs> Roanoke, Virginia, oh. which is not deep south, but it was south mm -hmm. enough. And, uh, and went into military service at the end of World War II. Was a military correspondent writing for various newspapers and all. And uh, at the tender age of 17 and 18, and then uh, went to Ronald College, graduated from there, also Columbia University. In what, if I may? Uh, English, basically. Uh, yeah, right. Basically English, right. uh, uh -huh. perhaps French history. Mm -hmm. uh, then I taught for a number of years. I did many things, taught here and in France and in Greece. And was, was that in, in the high school or university or college? It well, or? ranged all the way from uh, junior high, seventh grade. I don't oh, think boy. they call it junior high anymore. Uh -huh. Seventh grade up into the first two years of college. Okay, yeah. Community college, uh, that type of thing, two-year Seventh college. grade, seventh grade, you're about, that, that's really tell you 12 or 3 that's really a tough age <laughs> but well, let me tell you oh, yes, oh, yes, yes. springing yes. out all over and absolutely everything. yeah it's strange yeah. anyhow and the hormones are raging all that kind of yeah. and and uh, then after leaving teaching my wife and i went into the antiques business a while mm -hmm. i based a play on that called arthur of the little round table okay <laughs> yeah. and the little round table being a little gustav stickley tabaret mm -hmm. And I worked some for the Bronx Zoo and the education department, so I've done all kinds of things. But uh -huh. throughout my life, I've always written, written, written from the time I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And before, and the, this particular play and the man we're talking about, Eugene Jacques Bullard, uh, who was the first black combat aviator, right. uh, in a sense, completing this play was, to some extent, completing a pilgrimage. <laughs> it began for me when I was all of 14 years old, about 64 years ago. You did some flying or something. Yes, yeah, I, I, learned when way, when I, I learned to fly when I was when I learned to fly when I was 15 years old. That's young. It, it, very yeah. young, and yeah. then I got my um, I soloed at uh, 16, a young 16. Then at 17, I got my private pilot's license. I belonged to the Civil Air Patrol cadets. Did some missing plane patrol work and so on. Did down Virginia? Down in Virginia, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had my pilot's license before I had a driver's Just license. A little bit north of Kitty Hawk. Uh, quite, <laughs> quite a bit north. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I was always interested in aviation yeah. and flying. And family like you doing that? Your mother? No, they about did. Flying? absolutely. Yeah. My grandmother was all right. She yeah. would slip me a buck or two, and uh, That's I what learned. Grandmothers are there for, aren't they? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, they're right. they're yeah. wonderful people. Yeah, there should be right. more of them. <laughs> there should be more grandparents. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I did an end run around my parents. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. anyhow, I learned to fly. Paid for it largely by dashing out of school, which I hated, and rushing out to the airport and doing grease monkey work, polishing planes, waxing them, changing oil, stuff like that, and Didn't I flying time. Didn't cotton to the classroom, huh? Didn't cotton to school? Hated it. Yeah, really, me you too. Know, until I got I to college, and then I, I was saying, never I was off the exactly dean's list, but yeah. I detested high school. That's maybe why I too thought I was a pretty good teacher. Think, that it? A yeah. lot of things. Yeah. It was a captivity. Yeah. I wanted to be in the war, World uh, War II, obviously. I yeah. wanted to be a hero. You were too young stuff. then, is that it? For that? Uh, well, I went in at 17. At, but uh, it was over by uh, then? No, well, it was right at the end. Yeah, yeah I, right. I did not see combat or anything like that. I got a good poet friend of mine. I don't know if you happen to know him. But maybe the best performance artist in the country, Mikhail Horowitz, refers to the school system as minimal security correctional facility. Oh, yeah? You know, I don't know. That's a maybe jaundiced view, but <laughs> I know what you mean, yeah. yeah. Well, anyhow, no. um, <coughs> at the tender, tender age of 13 or 14, I discovered World War I aviation. It's really crazy, through books. Yeah. I was a great reader. Uh -huh. And in the process of becoming uh, very knowledgeable about World War I aviation, yeah. which is just, after all, a 
dozen years after the Wright brothers flew in 1903, right. uh, I kept running across reference to, to a, a black flyer. Mm -hmm. Some of the references were very pejorative. The N-word was used mm -hmm. sometimes, black of ace of spades, mm -hmm. other times with some admiration. Mm -hmm. His name was never mentioned. Uh -huh. And he was a part of my inner being. Yeah. He, I buried him somewhere, but he was always there. I did not learn this man's name until 10 years ago, uh -huh. and that quite by accident when I was riding on a bus on Amsterdam Avenue in uh -huh. New York City. Uh -huh. I met a woman who was just as talkative as I was. Isn't that started great? talking. Just, great <laughs> conversation on a bus in she, Manhattan. It's she easy. happened to be a research librarian at the Schomburg Center yes, up in Harlem. Harlem. Turns out she had just finished writing a book. No fooling. About blacks in aviation call. It was a bibliography. Isn't that a serendipitous, wonderful thing to make it's, life it's, worth living? It's almost yeah. spooky. Yeah. She wrote a book called uh, Invisible Wing, just out. Uh -huh. I rushed out, bought it. There were very few copies available. Yeah. I bought it, and there was my man, Eugene Jacques Bullard, originally Eugene That's James Bullard. That's the fellow Bullard. you had been aware of? I said, this him? is it. I've been, I was writing plays at the time. Yeah. I said, I've got to write about this man. Uh -huh. Fortunately, I discovered an outstanding Got uh, it here, I think. biography. Let's, let's this see. is it. I yeah. can't recommend it highly enough. It really is the definitive biography. Well, let, me, let me hold it up. Uh, Over this hold it? Let me hold this up, Norman. Uh, I'm happy let to say, is it still in print uh, the, or not? Uh, author, I, I know the author by yeah. telephone, Craig yeah. Lloyd. Just spoke to him the other day. He's in France at the moment. Uh -huh. And had a long talk. And I'm happy to say this book is coming out in paperback within the next few months. It's a wonderful read. I cannot encourage you enough to read it. Wonderful. The problem yeah. <laughs> for me yeah. is that there's so much here. And mm -hmm. I began to realize I'd never written a biographical play before. I mostly write comedies. Mm -hmm. And I, so help me God. You've got I will a never great write. satirical sense of humor. Well, I may be, so. but yeah. I tell you, I will never again write a biographical play. It's too, it's too heartrending. There's too much you have to leave out. Uh -huh. I've left out so much more about mm -hmm. this man that I put in because as, as a... Um, writer friend of mine is a fellow member of Times Square Playwrights put yeah. it, Rudy Gray, yeah. he says, you got to ask yourself seriously, mm -hmm. are you a biographer, historian, or are you a playwright? Mm -hmm. The answer is obvious, I have to say, I'm a playwright, and I've got to do what works on the stage. Okay, now that's a whole lot you just uh, you bit off there. Uh, so unfortunately, that kind of thing, because yes. you've done a, and maybe, and we're going to deal in detail with, we've got pictures and everything of this, but some of the other things you've done, because you've done a lot of satirical comedy, and if you're mm -hmm. doing something, I, I, I said to you on the telephone the other day, I saw Norman Mailer in a <coughs> uh, interview mm -hmm. that Charlie Rose did one time. He said he thought there was no better way to depict reality in all of its pathos and absurdities and so forth than by fictional novel writing. Amen. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> I read somewhere once, as I think a 15-year-old boy in a, in a writer's uh, a book, you tell a lie in order to present the truth. Yeah, right, right. And in a sense, I've done this to some extent. There are 44 characters in this play. It's Boy, a lot of characters. How are you getting them all on the number, stage? Of the number, of the number, oh no, no. Oh. Uh, a, a cast of 11 can do it. Okay, right. You double, right. you treble. There's yeah. only one part, the part mm -hmm. of Bullard himself, mm -hmm. that is a single role. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do it with 11 actors, six white, Five blacks, mm -hmm. and that works beautifully. Mm -hmm. And uh, with some careful direction, it's also sort of multimedia. Uh -huh. uh, there's Good. the sound, there's uh, there are images, and so on have that you, separate have you, the scenes. You've done mostly. You've done playwright. Have you ever done screenwriting? Have you done anything? No, in I have film? no desire. To. I Different, started writing this. No desire. Well, let's put it this way. Yeah. I have no talent. It's not a matter of not desire. Is I would love to be able talent to. Talent from playwriting to screenwriting. I would suspect that playwriting. Uh, is more difficult. You think so, yeah. Because yeah. with screenwriting, it is such a collective effort. Yeah. Where with playwriting, it's a kind of lonely, sit down, you know, write a novel type of thing or a poem or what have you. Yeah. Um, no, I think, well, uh, playwriting's where it's at for but me. I started it. this as a movie, uh -huh. and I couldn't do it. You started it as a movie. I did, because did it should be an epic film. Yeah. The problem, yeah. that my one <laughs> potential complaint is that as a film, you might lose sight of the man himself. Uh -huh. uh, could I read, uh, this is from a flyer. Could I, could I just read this one little sure, blurb? Sure, and then let's show the which flyer I think, after uh, you've read well, it. Here's you the read flyer. Here's the flyer, and maybe you can read from it. We can, <laughs> we can do both, multimedia. This is a flyer for the next public so reading, in, which is going to be up in Mount Vernon. Yeah, I just want to read you. No, uh, keep your hand out of the way uh, so they can see it. I'm okay. 
And it, it, the name of my play is A Man With Medals and A Man Without. Mm -hmm. Medals might proclaim some heroic acts, although most of them go unsung and unknown. But as a poet once put it, a man's a man for all that. And Eugene Bullard, who met his enemy at Verdun and elsewhere, even in the skies, and racist everywhere, never surrendered. The trick, he said, is to not let it do things to you. When they poison you, then they've won. Aha, uh -huh, that's interesting, yeah. And, I and this is an announcement of a reading or something? Uh, yeah, yeah, this reading is going to be December 2nd at Mount, uh, the theater in Mount Vernon. Oh, we, good. Uh, we were invited. We had a public reading less than two weeks ago, uh -huh. and it was terribly well received. We even had a number of Tuskegee Airmen in the audience. Good deal. And uh, as a matter of fact, during the, uh, um, <coughs> during the curtain call, we stopped the curtain call, threw the house lights on, and acknowledged the Tuskegee Airmen and they got a rising ovation. Great deal. Good, great, yeah. good deal. That's really It was good. a great moment because, and Bullard flew 25 years before the Tuskegee Airmen trained. wonder if we could back up a little if you don't sure. mind. Back up a little. I did a program a little, uh, and uh, bring it up, and you're talking about the playwright and the movie screenwright. Uh, I did a program with a woman named Alexandria Fuller. I don't know if you know her. She's a writer. No. Los Angeles Times says she's <coughs> one of the best writers. <coughs> the best 10 writers of the last decade. She writes, she wrote a novel called Scribbling the Cat about Zimbabwe. And I did it with her and I ended up, I said, when you're doing that, uh, she ended up by saying she thought all writing, now she's talking about writing, a novel, now, should be in the right, it should be cinemographic. That is that you're writing with the scene, you know, it's like cinemographic, you're setting it up and thinking uh, cinemographically. She ended the program stressing that in her mind. Well, you maybe, I could, uh, maybe I could be cute. And then this question <laughs> of the difference between the playwright and the, and the cinema or the uh, uh, film, it's a, it's a different medium, I guess, right? I'm it really is. As someone it who really is. But after all, uh, the theater is also visual. But I think the visual in the theater, even with wonderful special effects that stage uh, stages can do today, the opera. remarkable, absolutely, totally remarkable. Mm. Um, even with all of that, I think the focus is less on the less on the visual and more on the word. Uh -huh. Yeah, in the but theater. I think there is the difference, and I think that's a relatively large difference. Uh -huh. and I love I love movies. I do too. And I love the stage too. And it also, your movie is getting back closer to a multi-sensorial thing. I, you don't have a smell. We get the holography at one point, but it's getting back closer to the way we perceive things as we walk through life. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, as I said, if yeah. this could be yeah. made, this should be an epic film. I mean, uh -huh. dog fights over the battlefields of yeah, France. Yeah, great. But if it doesn't ultimately lose focus of this on this, uh, this yeah. inner individual who uh -huh. was really quite a remarkable person, yeah. and by the way, yeah. there are a lot of very amusing scenes mm. in this. Uh, in and this you do have an ear for and a heart for comedy, don't you? I love you? it. Yeah, <laughs> you got you a, really what was it? Really Adley Stevenson, stuff. after yeah. he lost to yeah. Eisenhower yeah. first or second time, yeah. said, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm too too old to cry. It hurts too much to laugh. Yeah, the man but with the hole in the sole of his shoe. That's Remember right. that photograph? Oh yeah. yeah. But you know, I uh, I do love laughter. Mm -hmm. And there is one. I Thank think the God for laughter. I think I would shrivel up and die if I, I could not satirically would. laugh at the absurd uh, yeah. scene of the human situation, particularly now, if I may say so. Uh, I couldn't it's agree Beckett more. Writ large. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting about humor. I think survival groups, blacks, Jews, yeah. gypsies perhaps, yeah, yeah. they all develop their own particular kind of humor, which I suspect is a form of survival right, right. and coping but yeah. with the dark powers that be. But anyhow, um, there is a very funny scene from the play. Could I, could I just mention it? And Absolutely. Let us know. There's a picture in here. If you'll yeah, hold, hold it up, let, let me find it. Take them a while to focus on it. But uh, it's this one right here. All right, let's get that. Take we that paper. We this want one this right one here. here. If you can focus on that. If we can see this picture. This is, for, again, from the life of Bullard. Bullard huh? Yes, it is. It'll take him a minute to come up with Okay, it. well, and, and the person you're about to see is a young man in this picture in the World War I uniform. His name is can. Jefferson, or was Jefferson Davis. Hey, God, Jefferson the, president, the <laughs> president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis Dixon, yeah. and he was from Natchez, Mississippi. Now, he looked like a white man to me. And he was white. Yeah. And he and Bullard were absolutely close buddies, and it's very interesting. Yeah. They were friendly enemies in a sense. 
he heard that Bullard was going to maybe learn to fly after getting badly wounded. If they're done, he couldn't march anymore in the Foreign Legion. Uh -huh. So he said, my God, no, no Negro's ever flown a plane. How could a Negro learn to fly? Now, come on. Come on, Gene. Isn't that interesting and, they would have such a concept? And he had that concept, mm -hmm. and he said, and I have in the play, I say, you know, Gene, I'm not that all that redneck, but let's keep the record straight. Mm -hmm. He says, I'll bet you $2,000 you're never going to learn to fly. Now, he said that to his good friend Bullard, mm -hmm. you can't fly mm -hmm. because you're a Negro. Uh, oh, exactly, he was saying that. Yeah, yeah. But Bullard said, but did they make a yes, wager? I can, yes, I can. He says, I'll take you up on the bet. Mm -hmm. And they, they stopped at the moment, and then... The day came when Bullard came up to him and he said, Jeff, tell you what, how about that bet, $2,000? Jeff said, you ain't got that kind of money. $2,000 real, real money. 2000 that's real, real money, real in, money in those days. days. Yeah, yeah. Bullard says, hell, I don't. Uh, he got him a bag. <laughs> and and he, he counted out his $2,000. Uh -huh. And, of course, Dixon nearly dropped dead. He uh -huh. counted out his. They had the bet. Uh -huh. <laughs> they met at a cafe. And the two backers, the two white friends of Bullard, very close friends, mm -hmm. both of them painters, by the way, mm -hmm. successful painters. Who were they, you remember? Uh, yeah, one was named Moise Kiesling, uh -huh. <coughs> a, um, a Jew from Poland mm -hmm. who came to Paris to learn to paint, right. joined the French Foreign Legion, mm -hmm. like Bullard, mm -hmm. got shot all to hell, mm -hmm. wounded a hero, uh -huh. was made a French citizen as uh -huh. a result. Uh -huh. And uh, he and Bullard were very, very close. Bullard used to spend time at his studio. Mm -hmm. and he'd yeah. put him up and so on, treating yeah. him to drinks. Yeah. The other guy was Gilbert White, a uh -huh. very wealthy, very successful American painter uh -huh. from, I think, New England. Uh -huh. They staked him. He was successful as a painter? As a painter. Oh, yes, Boy, very much so. They both were, actually. Which was both artists, right? Kiesling eventually was so, and he had friends like Picasso and Modigliani, all Boy, these guys. the biggies, yeah. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and anyhow, they, they staked Bullard, and the day came, they met Dixon, mm -hmm. and Bullard walks in this magnificent outfit with a yeah. scarlet, <laughs> I love it. scarlet yeah. tunic yeah. tan. Yeah, you got pants. a picture. Is that what yeah, that, like? and Well, no, that, that's when he was in the Foreign Legion. Yeah, that's, that's not his flying picture. uniform. Yeah. And he walks in, this man, mm. with his French aviator wings mm -hmm. on and all, yeah. his quad de guerre, right. and they're done, <laughs> and, the, and the fourager uh, on, his, on his left shoulder, uh -huh. and Dixon nearly dropped dead. <laughs> but he Isn't was a good that sport. Telling us and, a lot. And he, and he counted out the two thousand bucks. Yeah. So there was, <laughs> there, there was Bullard with four thousand dollars. He gave back two thousand. He paid yeah, back. Right. And he treated them all to the best meal. They in got Paris. this film, Back to the Future. We can go back in time. I wish I could go back in time and make that. Would that have been a beautiful? I could make my fortune. Would that, that have been a beautiful? If you could go back and well, this is a role. play, and it's, I think it's one of the best scenes in my play. Oh, you got it in the play. Oh, absolutely. Now you put the play together yourself based upon mm -hmm. your research and all that sort of thing. The the play consists of 23 scenes. That's a lot of scenes. Yeah. The scenes are very short. Mm -hmm. I, I consider the play a kind of pointillistic effect. Okay. Dot, 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 dot. Mm -hmm. Add it all together. Right. Funny, tragic, shocking, uh, uh, exciting. Yeah. And perhaps out of it comes a portrait of mm -hmm. this person named Eugene. His original name was Eugene James Bullard. He changed it to Eugene Jacques Bullard. Oh, good. He won 15 medals with the French in two world wars. Now, wait a minute. He, let me get it straight. If I could, bi biographical stuff. Where was he from? And, and He what was, was born in abject poverty. <laughs> I mean abject. Columbus, Georgia, in about, I think, 1895 was That the would year have been a tough road to hoe, wouldn't it? Damn right. Uh -huh. His father... Uh, oh, it was it was it was they were brutally poor. Uh -huh. The mother died when he was very young. Mm -hmm. He was one of a number of children, and he survived. And his father, he was his father's favorite. Mm -hmm. He was called Honey, mm -hmm. but his father, as he used to say, whooped him more than the others. Oh dear me! His father was very tough on him because uh -huh. he recognized something special here. But he wanted this boy to survive. Mm -hmm. He wanted him to get disciplined. Mm -hmm. And at the age of eleven. He ran away from home. Well, that's pretty. He would yeah. never see his father again, even though I have in the play. Mm -hmm. His sister Pauline says, "You hate your daddy." He says, "No, I love my daddy, but I don't like him." Mm -hmm. He right. runs away. <laughs> Make a long story short, yeah. he gets connected with a gang of gypsies. Uh -huh. These are English gypsies, the Stanley Gypsies. This is all true. This is. I was going to say you're not uh, making this. Oh up. no, no, no. This you don't totally have to. True. You don't have to elaborate on reality. Oh, I'm telling and you. And that's I, what you're saying is so high when you're writing biography exactly. because you've got a script. 
Oh, God. You got a thing. Really? Yeah, you it's can't. terrible. Because the other things you've done, you sort of conjured out of your mind, more or less. To Just play right. Oh yeah. I'll, and if you got I'll, a I'll do it again. Tabla rasa, you can write. You can make anything you want. You it's know? a lot more fun. But you've got to stick to the facts. To man, some extent, as yes. Mr. But Friday. he joins the gypsies, and what's mm. interesting, it's his first exposure to another type of people. Uh -huh. And his ex his 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 experiences with white people was mixed. Yeah. It wasn't always bad. But oh. more often than not, it was seriously oh. so. He's still seriously down in deep so. South, is he? Uh, no. Deep, deep south, and boy, I tell you, it was oh, rough then yeah. for a black, oh, uh, little black yeah. kid. Yeah, yeah. He had a he had a pet goat mm. <coughs> and a little goat cart, mm. and the white kids would tease him. Why don't you kill your goat and eat him, and then you could you could make firewood out of your cart? Stuff like this yeah. it was cruel, yeah. and he got beaten up and all. Anyhow, he runs away from home at eleven. Gypsies joins the gypsies, Stanley. Huh? He joins the Stanley Gypsies. You ever hear? You ever hear of the gone to Croatan? No. There's a group of people that were slaves, runaway slaves, uh, Indians, and some poor white trash. Copper. They were. They got together. They formed the basis of people in Indiana, and it was out of there that Fard came to found the Nation of Islam. Oh. Uh, yeah, and there were people that were like, they would migrate. They would not stay put. They wouldn't mm. get bourgeois. Well, no. And no, it no, was the, interesting. The, uh, no, these Stanley Gypsies, gypsies were also these were in. These were they immigrants were from England up there who wandered up in around. Indiana. Excuse me, that was up in Indiana, yeah. yeah no, these were, <laughs> they wandered around. There were Gypsies yeah. all over. Yeah. And they took him in. They treated him beautifully. They taught him how to ride horses, and he mm -hmm. was a good Jockey, uh -huh. and uh, uh, they they liked him, and, and he was accepted as a human being. It meant mm -hmm. a lot to him. Mm -hmm. One thing he couldn't stand mm -hmm. was ever he just really would go berserk when everybody anybody called him nigger. He couldn't take it. That would be a hard thing to do in and, the south uh, because and, it was uh, coming uh, off the lips oh, with oh, alarming you, regularity. I, I think. Yeah, okay, but in being exposed to these gypsies, one he was exposed to a foreign language. They right. often spoke Romani. He picked up right, a little. He right. was good at that. He was bright. Yeah. He, he was exposed to a different type of people, mm -hmm. and they told him about a faraway land where people are treated better. <laughs> they, they were talking about yeah. England. Yeah, England. And England, huh. he, the England where the yeah. hell's that? He didn't know. Anyhow, he leaves them. When he found out they were not returning to England, mm -hmm. he wouldn't stay with them. He went on, and he got connected with a white family called the Turners. This is true. Turner. And they, 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 he became their Still favorite. Still in the South. Mm -hmm. uh. It's Georgia. Mm. Uh, he became their favorite stable boy. Uh -huh. And there's a very funny scene in the uh -huh. play, once uh -huh. again. This is true. Uh -huh. comes from his little bit, the diary that he wrote, uh -huh. um, where he says, he, he's very angry. And they say, uh -huh. what's wrong with you, boy? Uh -huh. And he says, I won't be called nigger no more. Uh -huh. And they say, what do you want to How be called? How old he is here now? He's oh. about, so oh, now he's about 15, okay. 16. Right. He says, won't be called nigger no more. And they said, well, what we call you? Uh -huh. He said, you call me Jeannie, you call me Gypsy. Uh -huh. He says, all right, we'll call Eugene. Yeah. And he says, you get all the other. He said, we call it all, all these servants niggers. That's, yeah. the, that's the way it is. Yeah, right, right, so right. he calls them all in. Mm -hmm. And he says, you listen up. This here boy is called Gene from now on, and that goes for all you niggers out there. <laughs> that's a scene <laughs> hey, in the play, and yeah. that's a true scene. A uh, true scene <laughs> happened, right? You've yep. done a lot of research on this guy, right? Oh, God. Yeah, and he's then huh. he stows away, make a long story short, he ends up in Norfolk, Virginia, stows away on a German freighter called the Marta Rus. Uh -huh. He's got all of 50 cents in his pocket. Mm -hmm. He gets captured. They find him. He's half starved. Uh -huh. And they they're, they're rough, but they treat him rather decently. Uh -huh. And he begins to pick up German. He uh -huh. apparently has a linguistic yeah. ear. Right, right, right. And he picks up German, and they put him to work in the boiler room. Wow. I have seen him. Harry Ape. And, uh -huh. oh, boy, but he, and he says, he says first, it can't be hotter than Columbus Georgia in July, but he yeah. comes up on the deck and he says, it's hotter. Yeah. <laughs> Make a long story short, yeah. they discharge him and they treat him pretty decently. He gets over to and Germany. And they pay him something to, yeah. he gets to Aberdeen, Scotland. To Aberdeen, Scotland, yeah. And he says, even though they, they everybody calls him Jack Johnson. Oh, uh, yeah. Because he's yeah. the reference. Mm. And they treat him all right. Mm -hmm. He ends in up Aberdeen, in though, you know. Aberdeen. He yeah. ends up in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. He learns to fight. He meets a a, a black fighter named Dixie Kid, mm -hmm. Aaron Lester Brown, real mm -hmm. guy, yeah. West welterweight champion, who takes him over, mm -hmm. teaches him to fight. And Bull is a good fighter. He's yeah. not great, but yeah. he's good. Right. He in between does some very humiliating things. What was his weight? Do you know. Uh, 
heavyweight, was, light heavyweight, no, 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 no. He oh. was, I think, lightweight. Lightweight. He light. had to come up to lightweight. Oh. He was not a big man. Uh, no, okay. <clears throat> and um, uh, he he does all. He joins a group, a touring group called Freeman's Piccaninnies. 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 Yeah, yeah, you know. It's so a we're saying that I hope for the joking. <laughs> he had a good sense of humor. There's no oh, yes. art. He had a marvelous and sense of humor. And he could laugh humor. at things and he see could things laugh, but he was also very was also fast steely. on the fifth. Yeah, I understand. That's a good number. combination, don't you oh, think? Oh, yeah, I, I think so. You know. Anyhow, he also, it was a while, in a carnival <coughs> where they throw balls at you and so on, oh. this sort of thing. Uh, I, yeah, I think that ability to laugh in the face of uh, stereotyping <coughs> and so forth is a great saving grace, an amazing grace, and it's one. He I remember Easton and Stokely Carmichael, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, the guy who did all this, sure. and he had a, he, one of the things I remember about him so well, we roomed together and stuff and stuff. Really? And, uh, he was so funny. Really? He was so funny. He was dead serious, mm. but he was really a great sense of humor. Well, apparently I think it's Bullard, remarkable Bullard a had a remarkable, a Bullard had a remarkable facility for making friends All right. of yeah. whatever color. Right. And he he got to Paris, mm -hmm. which is really where he wanted to go. He had heard wonderful things. Right. He got to Paris well, 19, a lot going on in, in 1913. Europe, well, think of all the jazz musicians yeah. went to okay, Europe. Well, that's they, later. Yeah, yeah, it's 1914 later. Right. comes, right. World War I. Right. What does he do? He is so appreciative of France. It's the first time he really felt he was treated like a, a human being. Mm -hmm. He joins the French Foreign Legion. Wow. And he gets put in the 170th Regiment, who are known, get to be known by the Germans. It's true. Les Irondelles de la Mort, the Swallows of Death. Wow. And he is a machine gunner. <laughs> in the French Foreign Legion. In the French Foreign Legion. Good he God, shoots what a, a, movie uh, he shoots a Hotchkiss mean. machine gun. Mm -hmm. And he goes through all kinds of battles. He gets a bullet, grazes his head, blood trickling down. But he goes on. They give him taffia to drink, which makes him wilder and crazier. Give him what? Taffia. It's a very taffia. tough. It's like uh, right. the Greek raki. It's a very alcoholic drink. Like a rock. Just, it, uh, no, the Rocky, R A K I. It's it's it, uh, like uh, taffy, T A F I A. It's okay, a, uh, okay, okay. it's a drink that makes him crazy. I'm learning. Okay, yeah. He goes to Verdun, mm. the hellhole of Verdun. Oh, wait, this is in the First War. First World War. Now he's war. fighting with whom? French. The French. In the, the French, French Foreign okay. Legion. Uh, in the First War. He learns French. He's that fluent. He becomes war. fluent in French. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. He gets. He loses his his friends, right and left. They are killed around him. He becomes a messenger for some officers when he loses his gun crew. He then himself gets shot badly, a shell, badly. blows a hole in his leg. Uh -oh. They recover him about 24 hours later, more dead than alive. And he recovers. He gets shipped out to Leon. He's awarded the Quadic Gear with a star. Is that like, is that like the t is that like Congressional Medal of Honor? No, the Quadic no. Gear is alone. It would be closer to our uh, star. Silver, Silver Star. Silver Star. Okay. Silver Star. Still. Between Good. Silver Star and Distinguished Service Cross. Did he Cross. find prejudice in the French uh, military situation as you would have in the American? We didn't have Zilch. into Tuskegee or anything. No. Yeah. Zilch. Yeah. Zilch. Zilch prejudice. Absolutely. Zilch prejudice. At really? least he never mentioned it. Not a small matter. Nope. I mean, that's a big matter sociologically of course. that there was a thing in Europe. Here's what was, happens. Yeah. He goes there. He meets some friends, French friends, white, who say, look, you can't march anymore. You're a machine gunner. Why don't you go on a machine gunner from airplanes? You don't have to march around. I said, okay. And he decides he's going to learn machine gunning, but somebody else. He meets a young white boy named mm -hmm. Edmund Genet, mm -hmm. a young Genet. white American Genet. who he even refers to in letters home as that niger, N-I-G-E-R. He can't spell yeah. nigger. Yeah. And he's very suspicious of him. Mm -hmm. But then they become the closest of friends. Really, yeah, okay. Really close. And he says, you know, you ought to learn to fly. Yeah. Gonna, you're going to get paid after we were forming something called the Lafayette Escadrilla, mm -hmm. and you can learn to fly. This is along about the time he made that bet for two thousand dollars. This is where it comes in. I would have liked to have been there to back <laughs> that back up. This and is not out. You could have gotten odds. This is nineteen sixty. You should be able to get odds against the stupid prejudice of stereotypical yeah. thinking and bet against it. Right. They should have that somehow. Nick the Greek should be there to make those yeah, bets. That's right. Out. Well, anyhow, yeah. there it is, and he learns mm. to fly. He, uh, he shoots down two planes, they're mm. unconfirmed. One of his closest friends is a crazy French aviator named Jean Navarre, mm. a, a great French ace mm -hmm. and a total lunatic, mm -hmm. and they become very close. <laughs> he plays Lunatics all kinds of... Lunatics of the world unite. Yeah, he yeah. becomes a bullet, one of Buller's closest friends, uh -huh. and he's a total maniac, and uh, they pal around a lot. Mm. And Bullard 
<laughs> Bullard has a prostitute friend, mm. and he manages to get off of her her little pet spider monkey. Spider monkey. And he flies with a They're little sweet. monkey. A little spider yeah, monkey about this yeah, big, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he flies with the spider monkey, in puts it, it under its tutti. Wait a minute, how did he learn to fly? In the French? Uh, yeah, uh, the French taught him to fly. Him you know, you learn to fly a spad or a plane. Which and when he the, made the bet, he wasn't in the French thing where he was learning yes, to fly. Yes, he was going. He was going, going to, to go learn into to fly. It, huh? yeah. What a great situation to make a bet. And he flies with his pet monkey, Jimmy, and um, he, he, he comes home one day with 96 bullet holes in his plane, stays oh. a bet of the plane's tail than mine. What a great movie this could be, like yep. the Sting. I mean, the thing of w making the bet and doing that, what a All movie. This, yeah. Who's going to play him? Anyhow, the yeah. war ends. Yeah. He's, um, <coughs> he meets, oh. Will Smith could play him, maybe. What happens yeah. is this, the Americans enter the war, yeah. and he's not overly enthusiastic because yeah. he knows damn well what's going to happen. Because yeah. the Americans come to France with their enthusiasm and their arms and their might and their, their did energy. He his, did he keep his American citizenship all the time or what? Or did he no, no, he, he may retained it because um, in the state, if, if you went joined the Foreign Legion, you weren't asked to renounce your citizenship. All right, yeah. If you joined the British military, you had to renounce citizenship. That's interesting. That's so an anyhow, interesting note, yeah. he, he, um, he, he was an American. He had very mixed feelings yeah. because he knew what was going to happen. He was totally right because uh -huh. the Americans came over with Jim Crow. Yeah, uh, isn't in the military. Isn't that interesting? And yeah, I mean, they care more. Let's take one re one great uh, black American regiment, the Harlem Hellfighters. Yeah. They weren't called that then. There was the three, the 15th uh, uh, Lightfoot Infantry uh -huh. came there. They were trained to fight, but Pershing, listening very seriously, General Pershing, head of the American armies, yeah. listening to his fellow officers, uh, subordinates, said we will not, we cannot, absolutely will not go into combat side by side with blacks. <coughs> so he, what he something. did, the French were so desperate, he says, okay, I'll give them all to the French, and he did, and they became known as the 369th Harlem Hellfighters. They wore American uniforms with French helmets. Uh -huh. They were the first the first he fought decorated Tuskegee. Yeah, yeah. Tuskegee. Wait, yeah, we're yeah, talking I know, about I know, I know, I know, I know, yeah. They yeah, became the great. first French American unit decorated by the French. They were the first croix de guerre among the American units. They uh -huh. were the most heavily decorated and the first to reach the Rhine. The most heavily decorated among And yeah. Pershing still did not allow them to march as a unit down the Champs-Élysées through the Arc de Triomphe after the war. What a movie! But listen to and this. And that's real. Yeah, that's real. Yeah. Listen to this. When they marched out, when this regiment left Harlem and New York and so on, mm. they wouldn't let them march down Fifth Avenue. Most of the units oh, would march down Fifth Avenue over to the boats Isn't and go over there yeah, to the yeah, docks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't let them. Coming back, they were so decorated yeah. and famous. Mm -hmm. This time, they were allowed to march, and there is, um, well, there's some pictures. Yeah, we got some pictures we're going to yeah, This maybe is a heck of a story. What maybe a we could run some of these this pictures. This has got to become a movie. I guess This so, has got to become a movie. But, but you're putting let's it run some of these pictures, can we? Yeah, okay, we got some pictures we're going to show, and we got, what, six or seven or something yeah, like right. that? Yeah, right. I, I kind of point And we'll talk along. over these pictures, and then I think we've also got a piece of music. Uh, yeah, that'll we'll come a little later, too. Thing. But let's see if we can set that up. We've got a few slides on a CD, and we'll show them, and maybe we can talk you can talk over it. And maybe uh, I can kind of... So oh, you can set them okay. Up. These are the Harlem Hellfighters. There you go. Coming back, they were allowed to march at Fifth Avenue. And you want to know something? What? They refused to march American style. That's the French phalanx you see there. I'll be done. They marched French phalanx, 20 across, shoulders touching. And guess who was the drum major leading them? None other than Bill Bojangles Robinson. Oh, my God. He was one of the Harlem Hellfighters. Was Mr. Pershing upset that they uh, the I don't know if he was. He should have been. I'd like to have the close-up scene of his but face they as got, they did. They got an incredible welcome. And there this they would are. have been about 17, 18 yeah. now? Or so uh, this 19, is 1919. 19, and there 19. they are marching in front of the public library. I didn't know they had that thing going. What a story. OK, yep, good. That's the this French is Phalanx. in New York now? New then? York City. Uh, right here in 1919. 1919, God yep. bless them all. And there they are. Uh, yeah. Will the, a new picture come up now? Uh, yeah, you can change this picture. We can go to another picture. Yeah. Well, they're going to come back to us, I think, and then go to the picture. I think that's what they're going to do. They're going to oh, set up okay. another picture so we can talk between well, them. Well, I tell you, one story. of the great things yeah. is that the Harlem Hellfighters, yeah. and, and of course, 
Bullock became, became friendly with these guys. Bullock became friendly with these guys and escorted them around because, after all, Bullock was the man about town. Yeah, he could speak French. He knew his way around. He knew, he knew a lot of artists. The, he knew a lot of friends. He knew, yeah. the art, he knew everybody. Yeah. One of Here the most, we are, another oh, picture. This was one of Bullard's good friends. Yeah. His name is Ted Parson, uh -huh. a hero pilot with the Lafayette Escadrilla. Mm -hmm. By the way, that ribbon on, on the right, yeah. that's called a fourager. Uh -huh. uh, Bullard wore that too. Really? Okay. Uh, Parson flew with the uh, Lafayette Flying Corps. He was a good friend of Bullard's and he taught him something. He mm -hmm. taught him a French expression. Tout le sang qui coule est rouge, which means all blood runs red. Uh -huh. And that inspired Bullard. Yeah, And right. Bullard even caused, called his diary, All Blood Runs Red. Really? And he had a diary? Uh, it became yeah. like, a, he wrote a diary, yeah. 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 And, uh, but that was a good friend of his, Ted Parson. That's a rich source for you, that diary? Yeah. You had access to that? Uh, or is only it partially. Only partially. partially. Oh, yeah. It was never published, unfortunately. I think there's going to be more research on this man. Oh, I, I suspect oh, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, anyhow, Parson uh, remained his friend. Uh -huh. And in the Second World War, he became an admiral of mm -hmm. all things. Mm -hmm. He's dead now, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. anyhow, that's Ted Parson. He's okay. a good friend of Bullard's from the... Lafayette Flying Corps. Yeah, and we're going to move along with <coughs> some of these pictures, and they, I okay. think they're just going between them and everything like that. But uh, what a story! One of the most fascinating yeah. things about the Harlem and you go, Hellfighters. You go way back, ten years. You you picked up on the man's name finally. Finally, huh? yeah. But it was way back in your conscience when you when were When I was young. fourteen, when I yeah, first heard it's about really it. really interesting. Anyhow, that's interesting in and of itself. Really but you got to realize there were yeah. a lot of racial things happening at this time oh my gosh, because of the yeah. Americans. They even came over, the uh -huh. American military mm -hmm. created a white paper mm -hmm. in which they instructed French officers not to shake the hands of blacks, nope. not to eat with, not to socialize. Oh, you can't can. imagine. It's all in the Isn't play. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. It was bad. There was this. What about in Germany? And yet, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you, had, you had, he had marvelous white friends, American French, it, that's what's incredible. Yeah, and then yeah. you had these goons, these uh, oh. these uh, Ku Klux crackers. Yeah, right, right. And right, uh, right. some of it rather high level too. Uh -huh, they weren't uh -huh. all just you know from yeah. the farms of Mississippi. Yeah, right. Oh no, uh -huh. far from it. Yeah. But anyhow, one of the most amazing things about the mm. Harlem Hellfighters was their marching band. Yeah. yeah. Under under the uh, leadership, the maestroship of of James Reese Europe, uh -huh. and they were the ones. Uh -huh. This military band that brought jazz to Europe. No kidding, really? And That's I think what we made had, the way have, for all the jazz song, uh, Yeah, we're going to play that. in a while, but we've got to show some more of those pictures. I don't know if they're going to come up yeah. with some others. We okay. have some other pictures. Yeah, we'd and like if they to can show bring some them, more we do that. And then, ah. okay. <laughs> yeah. this, we're jumping ahead. This is in between the wars. This is Kiki, Kiki mm -hmm. Omonpanas. <laughs> she was an artist, model, mm -hmm. mistress, a painter mm -hmm. himself. Uh -huh. One of the people that uh, Bull Bullard knew everybody. He knew, yeah, he knew all the people in the art scene. After all, Bullard had a little, uh, 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 created his own little nightclub uh -huh. called the Grand Duke. Or the Why Big don't Duke. they? Where? Where? Uh, in Montmartre. In Montmartre, in, in Paris. Uh, yeah, yeah. On the right bank And he, he, knew, he was there in 1905 or something? He around was that time? all from between that the magic wars. Year? He was there yeah. from during the 1920s, uh -oh, okay. 1930s. Uh -huh. And then, of course, World War II came and he yeah. joined the resistance. Yeah. <coughs> but uh, Well, we can run some more. They'll be bringing those pictures up. Okay, we have a couple more of those pictures. Do and then we do have a piece of music we want to play. I would love to what play a hell that of music. A story. And you're putting the, has there been anything, that, how much has there been written on the man? Has there ever been a documentary made on television, History Channel? No. Has there been a film, anything like that? Not about really. Me? No, this man's not well enough known as I deem he is destined to be. Come. Well, uh, he's pretty unknown, but mm -hmm. at last, what a story. the American government finally officially recognized him made him a second lieutenant yeah. Here we are, many years picture. after his death. Ah, <laughs> in 1950 something, he's oh, an elevator up. operator at Rockefeller Center. Back he's wearing in the uniform. Now, then. And that's Dave Garraway, who yeah. had a famous show called The Day Show on I NBC. I remember it well, with monks. And he invited him to be on his show for 15 minutes, one minute for each of his 15 medals, <laughs> all given him by the French. This one is medal, it. which is the equivalent the highest French award is called the Legion of Honor, the uh -huh. Legion d'Honneur. He was <laughs> running a, an elevator uh, in Rockefeller Center Isn't that when he got the call from the French consul to come down and get his Legion of Honor. Isn't that something, <laughs> How's right? That? And he was on with J.C. Muggs. Or what was the name of that monkey that Garraway had? He had a number on there. I remember oh, that. I don't know that. No, but that's great. But he anyhow, he, he was and on the And that would be the top Garraway. honor the French can bestow, or is that getting that medal that he got? He got the Legion of Honor late. He got the Legion of Honor. 
He was but first I'm proposed. That Legion of Honor is a top medal like our Congressional yes. Medal of Honor. It would be equivalent. Yeah. I used to he think that's a great scene, yeah. Norman. Yeah, that's a great that. scene when they do that. And he and went you could have that in the movie. I'm seeing it as a movie. But the French, the French, in 1954, invited him before he they even gave him the Legion of Honor to come to Paris, all expenses paid, mm -hmm. and this guy was poor. He yeah. lived on East 116th Street in Harlem. He was it, very He's poor. been hanging out with all these people, winning medals, and he's yeah, right. poor, and, and he's, he's poor as a church called. Called. But, that, that, but he, But he's yeah. got a marvelous attitude. He's mm. got lots of friends, mm. and uh, he's invited by the French government, the highest elements, to come back to Paris with mm. a couple of other French war veterans uh -huh. and symbolically light the flame on the tomb of the unknown soldier. Oh, and he, dying, goes, yeah. he also goes back to Paris with Louis Armstrong oh, and he, as a kind of translator and so on. Uh -huh. And by the way, uh, was, uh, uh, uh. this is an interesting picture. Yeah. It, it's a painting, uh -huh. an allegorical painting that shows Bullard's life. Mm -hmm. It shows him as a pilot. There's his little monkey to the left. Mm -hmm. It shows a, a band, a, a, a drum, Zelly zigzag band. He played a drum. He lied. He said, "Oh yeah, I'm a great musician." Yeah, yeah. And he played a drum. He said, "I wasn't very good, but it was noisy." Uh -huh. And he kept him alive for a while because uh -huh. after the war he couldn't box anymore. His body was so he had been damaged. wounded also. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's hard to you box when you got a bullet in your leg. You can see everything in that picture, but it, yeah. it's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, yeah, yeah. And but it's sort of an allegorical That'd make picture. A, wouldn't that make a great postage stamp? Uh, he uh -huh. is being yeah. proposed. Uh -huh. He is being proposed by a, 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 um, a French-American uh, to the post office yeah. to appear on a stamp. Uh -huh. Good. No there, kidding. You there see, is I'm one, prescient. You there see, is, I knew You it really are. There is yeah. one black aviator. I know mm. her name is Bessie Coleman, mm -hmm. the first black female aviator and she's who died it died in a plane crash in 33 I think. She's coming up for a stand? No, she is on. Oh, she is already, mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. I know they got yep. Bucky Fuller. Got and I'm, I'm hoping it. I'm yeah. hoping Bullard will get on too. Yeah, that would be so. great. I, th right. I think what it's a story. Uh, yeah. He is now, there's a little bronze bust of him now in the uh, National Air and Space Museum. All right, good. Uh, in the World War One, in the other World War One section. I think there could be a larger presence than that, perhaps. You know? And, uh, and a larger so presence in the national consciousness. Well, let's and the world consciousness. He, at last, has been recognized. Yeah. And, of course, the Tuskegee Airmen yeah. were something like 900 or so black airmen, mm -hmm. World War One. Mm -hmm. who really were brilliant flyers Absolutely. and had a great history. Oh. I think about 70-some died in the war, and then, you know, many are, you know, they're elderly now, but at the first public reading of this play, mm -hmm. we had four or five of the Tuskegee. Here we got a, we got a uh, tombstone or something? This there? is the general tombstone marking the portion of Flushing Cemetery where are buried the French war veterans, mm -hmm. perhaps about two dozen. Uh -huh. Not very far from where Louis Armstrong is buried, by the way, just about 50 yards. I didn't know Louis Armstrong was buried in Armstrong. Yes, yeah, he okay. is. He's uh -huh. there. Uh -huh. And um, and, 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 and Bullock knew him. Well, Bullock knew he everybody. He and King Laurie, who just came out of, Saint, uh, out of uh, New Orleans, which is suffering so now, such a tragic kind of comment Horrible, on the yeah. current. Well, you know, right. what can you yeah, say? Yeah, right, right, right. It's beyond words. It is beyond words, yeah. Well, <coughs> well, but anyhow... This is an um, inspirational story, and I think we got one more slide or something like that, and we do want to make sure we get this uh, piece of music. Oh, I'd love, I'd love to play you. Because you're having, you're, the play you're putting together has got music? It is, is there, music. They, the play you put per, together. Does we Bullard have, come out in song? Or is it not a music? Uh, no, but there are Sophie, uh, Sophie Tucker, the last of the Red Hot Mamas. She yeah. sings it. Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker's <laughs> huge in and, and there's a wonderful character that Bullard knew. She, they were friendly enemies. Yeah, Bricktop was her right. name. What? Bricktop. Brick. Top. Brick right. top. This she, is his. Uh, uh, now this is place? his. This is his grave. And this is where in Flushing Cemetery, he was buried. Bullard, no. Yeah, yeah. He was mm -hmm. buried by the French War veterans here in New York. Uh -huh. He had converted to Catholicism, mm -hmm. buried out of a uh, church called uh, Saint Vincent de Paul. Mm -hmm. He was buried under a red, white, and blue flag, but the flag happened to be. French. I'll be darned. Isn't that and interesting? And how uh, old a man was he when he passed? And he was buried in a, uh, a foreign legionnaire's uniform. Really? And That's it. There was a big procession, and well, there it is. How and old was he when he passed? He was. Uh, or you happen to know? Maybe you don't know exactly. 66, 67. 66 he like died. He died in Metropolitan Hospital of stomach cancer. Uh -huh. In yep. where's Metropolitan Hospital? 100th Street. In, uh, here in New York, uh, right? Side. Yep. All right, right, right. Yep. What yep. a story. What a story indeed. That's incredible. An amazing man. Yeah. And I think 
the big thing is, to repeat again, is that this is a man who had every reason to hate a lot of people. Uh -huh. he, he didn't. He fought. He, well, that thing you he was an Uncle Tom. Yeah. He decked many a redneck. Yeah, okay. He was quick with the fist. Right. In fact, Bricktop said, man, you have a nasty temper and you have a foul mouth. Uh -huh. He would deliberately curse a lot and thought it to get her mad, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he, he was an interesting man. Yeah, he sure was. And what a story it is indeed. And this is all going on in that idea. I hadn't realized that they actually went over and the, the, there was not the prejudice there, and they brought the Jim Crow with them from the United States. They did. And That's the, America's yep. export to the world was Jim Crow. It really was. During uh, the 20s, it was yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Over and over uh, and over yeah. again, uh, they encountered this. But, you know, you had, you had well, other types of Americans. Well, you had some pretty bad uh, racism coming out of Europe, because I, re I keep reading every year the, 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 the thing of uh, Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes and the, and the racism was so thick that it was hard to believe. Yeah, and then the the British, the Belgian uh, racism yeah, in Africa. And the, and the it was very bad. White man's yeah. And we still got that remnant there and it's still a big question. But you know, Bullard, became, Bullard did become, was made a French citizen uh, with full... What a great story. With, it's with got to be full, made uh, a movie. I would hope or so. Or a documentary or something I'd like that. Love to play that song. Yeah, that right. And we got a song, right? We got a song and you, we got that. That's good. We're going to just keep the camera on us, but we got a song. This Tell song what is, it is called How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm. One of the the most popular songs to come out of World War One. Here it comes. Uh, and they hear me that time. I don't know if they can hear you. You could try and call. But don't I don't, talk too long. Keep it. Well, I, I'll hold it off. Okay, well, this is how you're going to keep them down on the farm. I remember. And it's what's unusual. If you heard it played by other bands from the time, you would realize this is unique. Uh -huh. This was syncopated. Uh -huh. It was like ragtime. Uh -huh. And well, ragtime. James Reese Europe's yeah. band, Harlem yeah. Hellfighters, yeah. would play all throughout Europe. Of course, Bullet knew all about them. Mm. Played host to them and so on. I'm sure. Mm. And um, I remember one picture showing a Harlem Hellfighters tuba pair uh -huh. with machine gun bullets mm. uh, in the horn of the tuba. Because really? these yeah. guys would do a concert and march back to the trenches mm -hmm. and go into combat again. No fooling. And really. the French worshipped them. Uh -huh. And they, this is le jazz. Mm. This is the first real mm. jazz that mm -hmm. they heard. And yeah. of course, they were addicts from then on. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, just another little part of the yeah. entire story. And it, it set a context where the jazz musicians were often able to go to France in order to find a very... Uh, in oh, Sidney Bechet and, and Sydney all, Bechet of, them, was all yeah, of them, right. all of them. And, you know, it was very interesting. Uh, the last of the Red Hot Mamas, Sophie Tucker, God bless she her. was the first important white entertainer to try to really integrate. Uh -huh. She tried very hard. She mm -hmm. spent a lot of time over there, too. He knew her there. He mm -hmm. knew her, of course, mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, I mean, I... I, I hope and some Josephine of you. Baker, she was, she was huge. She was over there. In oh, France, she was a big, Joseph, big, big hit. Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. She came over as a teenager. And you got that? How you gonna keep them down on the farm? With how you gonna keep them? Now that down recording the farm? you heard was made in 1919. 1919. You could hear the sound of it. Yeah. Oh, sure, absolutely. But um, after they've seen Paris. Paris. Yeah. How you gonna keep them down on the farm? Which is to some extent very true. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting. A number of Americans who came back as expats. Mm came back as very different people when they went, but there were others who came there. There was w an American organization mm -hmm. that tried to prevail on the French government to deport American blacks as undesirables. I'll be done. Send them back to the States yeah. where they could really be put in the proper place. Well, we had a long way to go and still be. And uh, I would say it was pretty bad, but mm. at the same time, you had these other elements that were occurring, and a little kernels of something good occurring, mm. oh. and you saw it. With, in, in Bullard's relationships to many, many people. Well, the Bullard was able to they have these uh, heroic uh, life stories against the grain, as it were, of the of the time. I was just think 1918, 19, we had that awful influenza that was all over more, the world. More died in the influenza than in, were killed in the war. Yeah, it was awful. 18, no, I it think, was 19, uh, international. 18, 19, 19, 19. So that's when that song country. was made. How are you going to keep them down on the farm? Well, and uh, and well, I can't help but thinking that those remnants of that Jim Crow stuff and everything like, and I, I'm going to make a comment about it because we're talking now. What's the date today? September seventh. 
we're just getting over and finding the 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 foul ups and whatnot that happened in uh, New Orleans now and you notice that uh, most of the people that were really disadvantaged down there had skin the uh, black and brown Well, you know, color. listen, this is the regime. It's still there. This government with Jeb Bush and oh, Catherine it's ha unbelievable. Ha Catherine Harris who's now in Congress. No. If they could is invalidate she go for the it, 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 yeah, she's in the Congress. No. If no, but they going to try to be a senator. Well, I I know. If they could invalidate uh -huh. over 20,000 minority votes. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Invalidated uh, yeah. legitimate uh -huh. some 20,000 minority votes and why not invalidate a few thousand lives? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that this, I don't know that the government was being racist, but it was being classist. Oh, no I mean, doubt. It was, no doubt. I mean, it so happened, most of the poor people there are, are black. Well, you were write few, that out on a few, world uh, scale, couldn't you? We had colonialism, and I, I read Cecil Rhodes every year, and the racism is so thick, the white man's burden, we're going to colonize the world, yeah, that, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. It's still operative there, and there alive some, and well yeah, in the There are some remnants Earth. of it. And, and yet, how do we deal with that? I mean, you people deal with, with uh, satire. <laughs> With humor, with the trouble ridicule, dealing with the ridicule. Humor, the trouble we do it with the ridicule is that satire often misses, that uh, people don't understand what the satire is. Oh, and it misses well, that's, its point. that's a problem. It, it's a it's bullet that goes astray, but, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's with really, bullet, really important. Yeah. And you're doing a very, a you're very keeping that comic ed edge to this play. And There's a lot play? of it in there, yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but with and he with, had that part of his yeah, personality. It's a serious play with yeah. comic, uh, comic elements, oh. but. This play is very upbeat. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. it, 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 it says things can be better. Mm -hmm. They often are. They mm -hmm. will be. Mm -hmm. They must be, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. it, you know, give me some men, some stout-hearted men, that kind of thing. We'll fight for the right. We adore it. Away, it's that. Mm -hmm. It's something else, too. You remember, mm -hmm. East is East and West is West. And never the Maybe. twain shall meet. Maybe and then they Kipling will. goes on to say, except when you have two great men. Uh -huh. Two strong men come together. Did you say hands. that, Kipling? Kipling. In that who very was very big? much an imperialist, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, not in my play. Yeah, no, no, Kipling. no, but he did say that. Because yeah, I always East do is that East, Kipling West, and West. Yeah, that's a Kipling And let two great men meet. It's something? called the Ballad of East and West. Is that what that is? And he yeah. says yeah. Two, right. two brave men from differing camps mm -hmm. meet. And they. So he had very mixed feelings. Yeah. He lost his own son in the war, too. Did course. he? I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but. But uh, they meet on the plaza of uh, globalizing world yeah. and so forth, and these things all come. And there's still these things. And so satire is still a really good vehicle. Maybe we could kick off, if you could, that's what the story. It's got to go. I wish you all the best. Let's let people know again. You're, you've done a reading, and you're going to put it out. There's another public reading. It's a stage reading. It's going to be in, it up um, again. It, uh, in the theater in Mount Vernon, if you want to contact me, my email. I'll be We're going to put that up It's going to be December the 2nd, uh, I believe 7 o'clock. PM, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's a 300-seat theater, and reservations oh, really? recommended, and uh, hope you'll come. Ernst Davis and is the mayor out there, nice uh, guy. Really? Ernst Davis is the mayor, yeah. do you want to yeah. get in touch with him, let him uh, know? Yeah, well, he know. He'll, he'll, he'll know, know yeah. yeah, he's a good right. guy, yeah. So, anyhow, I hope, That's um, really great. I hope some of you will be able to, to make Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Now, yeah. why don't you take off a few of the other things? You've been doing this for a long time. I mean, you've Well, I have another play. I you got have another play, got another thing going, do you? This is a Here we go, let let him see the ongoing, uh, the ongoing creative uh, overflow of Norman a, Weinstein. Th huh? Yeah, this is uh. a full-fledged equity uh. production uh, uh -huh. being done in uh, November at the Producers Club on 44th Street. Uh -huh. It's a sheer comedy. It's about a what I call a three a a, a, a comedy about an almost normal three-generation family. Uh, almost almost normal. normal. They're a little like yeah, it's a little like you can't take it with you. Yeah. Life with father and. It's 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 a fun thing. Now it you've written this. Yeah, that's my play. Now you write and direct and so forth. In this what? case, I'm also directing. Uh huh. Yeah. What about the Bullard thing? Uh, the Bullard thing? No, I'm not directing. You're that. not directing. Uh, Who's a person named Tom, a, a, a guy named Tom Thornton is and directing. And you got some that. good talent in there. And yeah. yeah. Uh, the, these are people out of our group called Times Square Playwrights. Yeah, talk a little about that. We got a couple well, minutes Times left. Well, Times Square Playwrights yeah. is a uh, an organization of it varies anywhere from 40 to 50 people. It's about, uh, it's probably about 40% mm, playwrights, 60% actors. We meet mix. religiously once a week, Tuesday. Happy to come, you down, come down. We meet usually on Midtown, 54th Street, different venues. And uh, we have cold readings. We have readings of short scenes, uh -huh. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh -huh. um, and the actors do absolutely cold readings. They're usually pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then there's an overflow and there's commentary. 40% right playwrights and uh, about 60% actors. actors. Yeah, roughly, That's not you know. in keeping. I mean, you get a play, you got 
40 people in the play and one playwright. So that's not the right, <laughs> right. ratio. How come there's so many playwrights as to actors in the... In, in, the, in this? Yeah. I mean, it's called like, Times Square You only need one playwright to know, write the whole thing and set but it out. The, the you need all these actors. Uh, well, it's a playwright's organization. Oh, that's why. Okay. It's called right. Times Square Playwright oh, for a play reason. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't catch <laughs> now, that. Now, actually, think. several of our uh, best actors are, oh, they wear two hats, are mm -hmm. also playwrights. Yeah, right. And they right. You know, re wear different roles, oh. men, women, black, white. We have a wonderful mix, really, mm -hmm. old, eight. We have one very elderly actress. Mm -hmm. I'm probably the Grandpa Moses of Broadway. I'm probably the oldest one there. But yeah. we have a few others who but are pretty co yeah, crotchety, yeah, you're too. Yeah, you're going to live yeah. forever. Yeah, and we have some very young ever. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah well that, 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 that's really good. You're putting, I really congratulate you on all of that. Have you written a novel? Uh, I we only got a minute wrote a so novel. Look. Other than the play, Totally right. unsuccessful. I okay. do have a book of poems I wrote. You wrote, we spoke about it yeah. on another program. Uh, it was a book of political or engagé poems mm -hmm. dealing with the Greek uh, dictatorship. Uh -huh in the 1960s Have and Have you 70s. written a book of uh, poems about the current dictatorship that's, yeah. written, that's emerging no, on this planet? No, it's a little too close to that. I'm afraid it would be too nauseous. Yeah, it might be too nauseous. That's, some things yeah. are just too nasty to present. No, I, can't, I, I, know, I, I, know. I can't really believe that 59 million of my fellow Americans voted for these thugs. Uh -huh. And, um, and it know. continues and seems to just get worse. It yeah, really, seems, things uh, can always get worse. They, they can do, get yeah. worse. And maybe if yeah. they do, and in times when things really get worse, if we ever need satire and a critical look and that's a satirical look at things. Well, I did write it's a satiric, in those yeah. times. I do have a satiric play. It's called Monkey's Nephew. Mm. The monkey's nephew is uh, Bush. Yeah. And he comes in contact with the ghost of Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> and Darwin wins. <laughs> and, Norman, uh, so good to see you. Thank Your you very pleasure. Much. The perception of a great New York uh, treasure, if I were, Norman Weinstein, playwright. He's got this program. Happy to have presented to us the personage of Mr. Bullard, who I... Uh, Venture to predict is going to become much more well known in the national and world consciousness because the story is absolutely phenomenal. All the best on that and all your work. And thanks a lot for coming in and sharing your thoughts. Thank you for having me. My great good pleasure and your pleasure to have his perceptions. We uh, invite you to tune in. Altogether, too short. We could go on talking for hours, uh, but we invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Thank you really very, very much, Norman, for all your work and for, as I say, coming in. It's good to see you again. You're welcome. Until tomorrow, then. So we could That's go it. on and on. No, we're not quite through because they got to roll the credits. So <laughs> they got to give me your okay. email. So don't oh, right, anything right. on toward young man because no, I won't. I'll, I'll try to line. watch my line. Try to watch your line. The <laughs> 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 board certainly didn't. Yeah, he, uh, he, he was a two So character. who's going to play him in the movie? Well, I tell you, who's playing him on stage yeah. is a young actor uh -huh. named Scott Williams, uh -huh. and he's absolutely terrific. Got and he's down. a marvelous cartoonist too, uh -huh. by the way. Uh -huh. And I have a good director, Tom Thornton's doing a fine job directing and also acting in it. Uh -huh. And I have a cast of 11. Okay. And uh, as I said, I hope some of you will come see it. And I and hope it will have... And uh, you're having final cut say on how the play is presented? Or is the director making changes? Or how does well, that work out? Well, he makes some, but Sometimes with my... Sometimes the playwrights we, we, get upset with what they do. Oh, no, no, no. We, 